Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report podcast. I'm your host, Vago Maradian. Our podcast is brought to you by Bell. Since 1935, Bell has been redefining flight. Learn more about its pioneering spirit at bellflight.com. Tensions between the United States and China and the rest of the world are escalating. Airbus is cutting costs. Suppliers are facing bankruptcies. India's next fighter and the Pulitzer Prize for the Seattle Times for its coverage of Boeing 737 MAX in the wake of two deadly crashes that grounded the jet for more than a year. Joining us now to discuss the last week on world markets are Dr. Rocket Ron Epstein of Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Sash Tuza of the independent equity research firm Agency Partners, and Richard Abalafia of the Teal Group Consultancy. Guys, welcome back. Good to be here, Vago. Thanks. Thanks, Vago. Always good to be here. Wouldn't be the start of a week without this, Vago. Thank you. Uh, exactly. It's, uh, it's always a highlight and it's always a treat. And before we get started, our global coverage is sponsored by Leonardo DRS. Northrop Grumman sponsors our weekly cyber report and our cyber coverage overall. Finn Contieri, Marinette Marine sponsors our naval coverage and Elbit Systems of America is sponsoring our virtual quad A and SOFIC coverage. And of course, Bell sponsors this podcast. Guys, let's start off with the uh, trade war. When we were talking just before we got started, Ron did mention that this was the single most uh, important development. Taiwan uh, Semiconductor is opening up a factory uh, in Arizona. That factory would be producing a lot of components that we now get from China. Uh, there is enormous amounts of pressure uh, on the part of not just folks in Washington, but also around the world uh, to bring supply lines back to their countries of origin and similarly punish China for its disinformation, bullying, uh, and also being the source of this virus and of uh, originally having lied about it. Ron, start us off. What are the economic implications of this next phase? We've been talking about there being a backlash uh, on China for a while. The Chinese did get a positive bounce uh, out of stuff uh, that was happening in their response and uh, Beijing stepping up to send aid uh, to countries. But then as the story got a little bit fuller, we realized that that aid wasn't donated. It was sold. Some of it didn't work. Uh, and then just frustration with Beijing for having originally lied about the virus. Where, where do we stand and, and what does this Taiwan semiconductor development tell us? And how is it going to replicate its way across not just the commercial ecosystem, but the aerospace ecosystem and eventually manifest itself in defense? Yeah, so that's a, that's a huge, humongous question, but um, let's take a first crack at it. Um, Taiwan Semi building a microprocessor fab in Arizona is a, it's a huge deal, um, you know, kind of tracking this sort of stuff in the tech community, which, which I do part of internal discussions at the bank. Um, it wasn't so obvious that they were going to do this. What they committed to do is, is building a $12 billion microprocessor fab. And, and why that's a big deal is Taiwan Semi and a few other companies are the only companies in the world with the capability of making this type of microprocessor on the nano scales that they can. Um, so not to kind of talk out of the technology that I fully understand, but um, they, they can do things others can't, and there's only a small handful of companies that can do it. And most of that production is in the Pacific Rim region. Taiwan Semi is one of the biggest. Um, Huawei is one of their bigger customers. And after some actions that, you know, that, that happened this week at the Department of Commerce that were, you know, targeting deeper restrictions around Huawei and licensing the use of US technology and software, which is part of this fabrication process, this is one of the things that fell out of it. And the, the timing of it and the speed at which it happened, I think surprised a lot of people. Now why it's meaningful is it's a, it's a first step. We'll see ultimately if it really does happen. Um, but it, it, you know, from what we know now, it really does seem like it'll happen. It's, and it's not just for something like iPhones, not that iPhones aren't important, but this is the core technology that kind of rips across um, a lot of things from you know, 5G to telephones to all the other applications for microprocessors. So that, in response to that, um, it, it was reported out of China that the Chinese government wants to put Boeing, among other companies, on their unreliable entities list, which would restrict the Chinese buying Boeing airplanes. If that indeed were to play out, and you know, we'll see what happens and, and all these things. I mean, it's, it's politics, it's a pandemic, so everything's kind of heated right now. Um, that, of course, would be you know, you know, bad for Boeing's order book, given 
everything else that's going on, right? You know, China was one of the areas where uh, there was, was expectation you might see some deliveries at some point. I know in Boeing's outlook for their 787s, getting down to seven per month, in that was factored in deliveries to China. So if indeed those deliveries didn't happen, then things might even go lower, or if they were delayed substantially, that would have a negative impact too. And then that would filter down through the supply chain. The next piece that's interesting is when you think about the implications that this has, if you broaden the definition of what is national security beyond just kind of the traditional stuff we talk about, but pandemics, you know, health related things, um, uh, pharmaceutical supply chains, the, the unwinding, if you will, the decoupling of the US and China could have broad implications. And then it would also have broad implications for potential you know, tension in the Pacific, um, you know, our allies in the region and our military stance in the region. Um, you know, things are going to be tough given all the stimulus that's been spent, the deficit, so on and so forth. But it could have some implication for defense spending, if nothing else, maybe even putting a floor on it. Who knows if it could boost it? But um, in, in that kind of environment, particularly in an election year where it's going to be the football that gets bounced back and forth that, you know, who can kind of be tougher, um, it probably at least sets a backdrop for expectations on you know defense posturing in the Pacific that might be more aggressive than we had thought just two months ago. Uh, and, and, and certainly from uh, a rhetorical uh, as well as an operational basis, the Chinese have been sort of stepping up their pressure, particularly uh, on uh, Taiwan in the wake of this. And there have been members of Congress, including Mike Gallagher, uh, the congressman uh, from Wisconsin, who's the co-chair of the U.S. Uh, Cyber uh, Space Solarium Commission, uh, has made the case why it would be great for the United States uh, to turn increasingly to Taiwan uh, for some of the the capabilities and the and the and the chips for the future, obviously, sort of getting around uh, Huawei. Richard, what's what's your sense? Yeah, you know, obviously, a strong agreement that this is going to be uh, well, getting a whole lot worse because of the election dynamic, and you're going to have people accusing each other of being soft on China, and of course, responding to that by being ever harder on China. It's going to be perhaps the issue that defines November, but um, along with the pandemic. But never let it be forgotten that, uh, as a wise man once said, uh, aerospace is kind of the designated hostage in the event of any Western China standoff. And in the short run, uh, yeah, you know, you've, you, you've got a big issue here because, frankly, Chinese capital is playing a large and growing role in jetliner financing. Matter of fact, this week, I would argue another big development, uh, United did a deal for a couple dozen uh, Max is in 787s, the sale and lease back with Bank of China. There are not a whole lot of jetliner finance operations eager to start doing uh, SLBs right now, but apparently the Chinese would. Uh, so the idea that in this rather critical moment when third party finance is going to be the only thing that sustains jetliner production, because God knows uh, intrinsic finance, organic finance at the airlines is not exactly uh, copious, um, that all of a sudden this might be cut off, that, that, that's a little terrifying. And of course, moving beyond that couple of years, you know, China's played such a big role in the comeback uh, of aviation after the last few downturns. Um, even if that's cut off for geopolitical reasons, there's just the likelihood that they won't be growing at the same pace they have in the past. So I think we need to prepare for that future recovery, be it in two years, be it in four, whatever, um, where the Chinese simply don't play as big a role. But in the short run, the financing part of the equation to me is uh, pretty damn scary. Uh, Sash, I want to get your sense on this. And as well as what happens on cost structures for people if they start moving, you know what I mean? There is, there is a positive element to this uh, that you would repatriate sort of, if you will, supply chains and, and uh, supply lines. At the same time, there's always cost associated with that. We're manufacturing stuff in China that feeds into the broader ecosystem in one capacity or another economic ecosystem because it's been financially advantageous to do so. So you're going to bear a cost at the end of the day by, by making this shift, even if it's an acceptable and important and necessary cost to bear. I don't think that European companies, certainly, but actually I don't think that the global civil aerospace industry is willing or ready to 
uh, repatriate uh, the, the degree of sourcing that is currently done in China, from China. Um, it's not just done for cost reasons, it's done for market entry reasons. Uh, you manufacture whatever they are, systems, subsystems, components in China, because that's part of the deal. It's, it, it's, it's offset for Chinese airlines buying your stuff. Um, arguably, Boeing took this less seriously than Airbus did because um, Boeing's activities in you know assembly uh, or work in china is limited really to applying a dash of paint and taking the plastic wrappers off the seating um for a, it was intended to be 737s it's a it's a real pachemkin facility that airbus set up um complete a320 family uh, assembly oh you know 15 years ago and is now doing completions of a330s as well and that very act got airbus from 15% of the Chinese market to over, over 50% of the Chinese market in just over a decade. Um, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't think that they will stop that or indeed, uh, you know, withdraw the, the overall subcontracting relationship uh, willingly because they cannot afford to, for the Chinese to uh, treat Airbus the same way that they are looking to treat Boeing, which is as the, you know, the least favoured uh, uh, aircraft supplier. I think that would be incredibly damaging for, for Airbus overall. Overall, my feeling is that you know, Europeans are not as engaged in the anti-Chinese war or you know, the, the Chinese blame war as the US is. That may change. There are, there are some politicians who are uh, in Europe, but they're very much in a minority at the moment. So what do you guys uh, think? And I should, I should point out that there was um, a little bit of concern uh, because there was the last major, uh, or what was to have been a major Taiwanese investment in the United States was the Foxconn plant uh, in uh, Wisconsin that has has managed to stall. So I'm glad that you caveated that, Ron. Uh, right, I mean, with projects this big and this complicated, there could always be uh, some uh, you know, something that comes up that that stops it. But I think also from a Taiwanese national standpoint, there this is seen as being a critically important strategic move uh, not just as a business case, but also uh, for the sort of strategic message uh, it, it sends more more broadly. Um, one, one point I might add on, sure. on just a commercial aerospace front with China, um, as we all know, uh, any growing economy needs a, is a, needs a functioning um, uh, airline, aer you know, air transportation uh, infrastructure. And, and to get there right now, the Chinese don't have a domestic capability to do it. Their, their greatest hope is the C919 program. But for example, the engines on that airplane are you know, leap, leap one Cs, right? That's a, that's a uh, CFM engine, right? So it's at least half that thing is, is American technology, right? So their, the, the Chinese best hope to get there is dependent on out of China technology. So two, two points. One, if indeed they were to really get rough on Boeing, it would not be that big a stretch of imagination to say, okay, well, you know what, we're not going to export avionics or the power plants you need for, or at least our components on those power plants uh, that you need um, for your leap, for your, your C919. So that program could, could be completely stalled, right? So that program kind of hangs in the balance, in my view, depending on how this goes. That's why these things are so complicated. Um, so I think I think that's uh, an, an important point to 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 bear in mind um, as we go forward. But but if you're we're looking at this as many have sort of prophesized of it being a second Cold War, albeit with different attributes and components, right? I mean the Russians were totally dependent. The, the Russians were trapped in their own inferior, both manufacturing. Uh, and engineering and scientific ecosystem, and they did not have access to the cutting edge technologies we have, whereas the Chinese absolutely do, does cutting them, and, and the concern is that we will go into a new Cold War where there are democratic nations that band together, there are the Chinese and the Russians and other nations band together, and then everybody in the middle you're competing for who sort of don't care, right? They're sort of okay with authoritarianism. They're not as democratic as we would like. At the end of the day, does that drive China to accelerate the development of its own ecosystem to steal a little bit more, 
to put the pedal no. to the metal and, and do its own development. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't, because the Chinese are doing that anyway, and they've been doing that for a decade. What we see now, the state of the ARJ21 and the state of the C919, or you could argue the non-state of those two aircraft, is a result of Chinese spending at a scale that hasn't been seen, even including European nations and Airbus in the 70s and 80s. And it shows how incredibly difficult it is to get into civil aerospace, to buy your way in, um, because it's more than just, let's throw a few tens or a lot of tens of billions at it. Uh, that there are real skills and black arts and difficult to gain technologies, which the Chinese have not yet gained, in my view. If I could just uh, second that, you know, strong agreement, except one big caveat, what, it won't drive them to accelerate what they've been going at a pretty good clip with, as you say, but it might accelerate them to close the borders. So far, they've been really loath to close the borders and say, hey, domestic airlines, you, you know, you must take an ARJ-21. Yes, it is a pile of crap held together with duct tape and with wings appended, but please take it instead of a foreign jet. They haven't done that, right? And what could change is that for the first time, they decide keeping in WTO, having some degree of free trade, which they more or less kind of do, is no longer their objective. They close the borders and, as I like to say, an aluminum curtain descends. So what, just one point I would add, um, and I think this is just kind of following on to Sasha's comments and then Richard's. You know, I've, I've toured China with other industrial analysts, right? So, you know, as a group, you know, we, we would take a group of investors to China. It was me and our machinery analyst or multi-industrial analyst. And as the aerospace guy, I went along, but there was really nothing to see because not really, we don't do anything over there. I mean, U.S. companies don't do a heck of a lot in aerospace in China. Everything that the Chinese get, for the most part, with the exception of some interior component, maybe some in-flight entertainment um, and some very low ad structure, that's what's, that's what's done in China, right? So I was pretty much bored on those trips. The point is, we collectively, uh, the, the countries that know how to build airplanes, never taught China how to do it. Um, so because of that, and to Richard's observation, it's extraordinarily difficult how to do, to do, um, uh, for a multitude of reasons we all know, um, it's, it's been, it's been slow going. Um, so, you know, when, when I look at that, the progress that could be made, could they eventually get there and have other countries done it? Yeah, of course, of course they can. It's just going to be slow going. The, the other point I would add, why I don't think they would ever really close the borders and say, you have to fly ARJ-21s that would make their own population probably pretty unhappy. And, and I base that statement on, you know, in the times that I've been to China and I've visited, um, there's this perception. Um, and this is another reason why you don't see a lot of regional jets or turboprops in China, is there's a perception that when you fly you know, a commercial airplane, it's a, it's a Boeing, it's a big, it's a, you know, the, the image of Nixon arriving in a 707 is what commercial aviation is. And, you know, no Airbus is on the scene and, and you know, with their set of products, but it's it's that it's not the RJ twenty one. And so I don't know unless the complete you know, mindset of the <clears throat> of the traveling public were to change. Yeah, right? but I, I gotta I gotta tell you something. It's it's not like every Russian walked up to a TU one fifty four and said, "Oh wow." <laughs> TU one fifty. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, countries will consume the aviation product if even if it's dictated by. Um, their political masters. L let me ask the, and I, I completely I, understand the prestige reasons for it, but what, what I'm, do, do the Chinese move on Embraer in that case? No, no, it doesn't even bother, too small. Okay. It, and it has, it has nothing with the exception of certification skills that they really need. I think they can afford to wait this one out, I'm afraid. I, 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 could I just, I mean, I, I hate disagreeing with Ron and, or, or Richard, and it happens very seldom, but, I would disagree. But or go I, on. I, if the opportunity no, presents guess, itself, take it, Sash. No, no, I, I, I'm doing this reluctantly. But th there are two points I'd make. One is that if you sit inside a C919 or indeed the mock-up of a C929, you will not feel that you are not inside a Western airliner. They really do feel like a very, very modern airliner in a way that they, I agree, the ARJ21 does not. And I think that that will overcome a lot of the uh, you know, the reluctance of the Chinese uh, traveling public. So I think this is an issue about when does the C919 finally make it? Um, and I've been over optimistic about that program for about four years. So uh, you probably shouldn't rely on my forecast on that one. But I think that 
you know, internally, it's a, it's a very, very good aircraft and the 929 even more so. My last you know, if I could just join in on that, um, I, I, won't, uh, I won't necessarily agree with that, but I will agree with Sasha's point that it might simply be a different world. I mean, we got to think what it was like back in the old Soviet Union when they simply said, we're sealing the borders, have a nice day, we're an authoritarian government. And, you know, it was about, I don't know, a year or two ago, uh, I said something to somebody about, you know, I, I sometimes find myself being a diplomat, pulling my punches, not calling the ARJ-21 a pile of crap. And he said, why do you care? The, the Chinese can't hear you. They're on the other side of a giant internet firewall. Nobody can even use Wikipedia over there unless they've got some kind of VPN. And uh, I was like, holy cow there is an emerging different world over there and it's going to come as second nature to close the borders to Western jets and mandate the use of the 919. Another analytical market for you to expand into, Richard. That's that's another way of, of looking at it. Uh, but your timing may be a little bit off at this point. Can I, can I add one point? Sure. Just for, I, I, and again, I um, have Sasha's sentiment about disagreeing with Sasha, but I will just modestly on, and I'm not saying the Chinese would necessarily work with Embraer, and I'm not saying that Embraer would want to work with the Chinese, but if you think about the relationship that Geely has with Volvo, right, where it's, the Swedes are making the cars, but they're owned by, right. by Geely, and the Swedes are designing the cars, could you imagine a scenario where Avic or Comac is an investor, a strategic investor in Embraer, and the quid pro quo is simply, okay, guys, um, you know, we're going to help invest in you to develop, who knows, a new right. whatever. Teach us how to do it. Uh, and and with Jair Bolsonaro there, well, see China, that happening, right? And China is the largest single export market for Brazil, right? Right. So, you know, and I'm, I'm yeah, I'm not trying to speculate and start rumors. And I want to be crystal clear about this, but. Could you, you know, is it possible to see something like a Volvo style deal? Yeah, maybe, right? That, that, to me, that doesn't seem like it would be out of the realm of possibility. We well, I, I, I have a feeling it, it might just be in this particular case, just because, you know, what would, what should the ARJ-21 be at, after it was consigned to the, the graveyard of bad aircraft? It should be any E-175. In other words, if they want to work with Embraer, they have to sort of, just be Embraer. 175 is an infinitely better plane. Similarly, they could keep going with the MA700, their prize large turboprop, or they could say, screw it, Embraer would do a much better job with the E3, so let's just do the E3 with them. In other words, they'd have to abandon all their pretensions before, they'd have to walk a long way out of their way before they came back a short distance correctly. <laughs> Extremely well said. And now a word from our sponsor. The Defense and Aerospace Report is brought to you by the Bell V280 Valor, bringing the mission technology of the future to the battlefield of today. Visit bellflight.com for more. We've got to move on. We have a lot of ground uh, to cover. We're going to go into a little bit of a lightning round with your guys' uh, uh, agreement. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Wall Street Journal report. FAA is considering temperature checks uh, before passengers uh, can board at a dozen uh, U.S. Uh, airports. Uh, at the same time, Dave Calhoun, uh, the Boeing CEO who just can't help himself, uh, I, I think is projecting that by September, a major U.S. airline will go out of business. That's infuriated a lot of airlines who let them know how infuriated they are. Uh, and that's prompted speculation about whether it's going to be American uh, or United. That's one of the ones that goes out, given United's major international route and Asia exposure. Uh, American short haul route. There's a sense that Delta and Southwest uh, are are going to be okay. So talk to us. Temperature checks, Ron. What does that mean? And which of the four airlines is the most vulnerable? And is this going to drive one of the airlines to not buy products from Boeing because they're so ticked off at Calhoun and at the company more broadly for being stuck without 737s? for a full year plus? So it's a, 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 you know, a, a couple of different issues. Temperature checks, that's just one more complication. And as we've talked about in the past, uh, it, it seems, I mean, there's been you know, multiple articles now written on 
you know, what the future of flying is going to look like until we have a vaccine or some other epidemiological solution. It's going to be more con inconvenience, can take more time, so on and so forth. So this is just more, another factor, right? But um, I think Richard commented on this you know, um, last week that w if that's part of a rules-based system that applies to everybody and how the whole thing works, then I don't know, it's, it just is what it is. We've got to learn how to live with um the the pandemic until it's not a pandemic and that's just might be one of the factors and um, clearly if it's you know, more convenient that's not going to encourage people to fly obviously but um if it allows people to fly um, on some level that's probably not bad with regard to you know calhoun's commentary it's it, it's probably realistic right i mean you know it, it's a i think it was a pretty um i think it was surprising because you know you're you're you're, you're one of the big large airplane companies and you're saying one of your customers is going to you know, going to roll over and drop dead or you know at least go into some sort of restructuring um which obviously would displace one of your customers but it's probably true right now which one that that's very hard for me to speculate right I mean, it, that's uh, almost impossible for me to, to say at this point however um you know we we work with the, the leasing companies we follow leasing companies and what the leasing companies will tell you is every single one of their customers has come to them to change terms, to you know, look at lease extensions, every single airline in the world is having difficulty, right? So, having you know the Boeing CEO come out and say, you kind of say the obvious, but I don't know, did their customers need to see, hear that from him at that point at that time? Probably not. So, from a PR perspective, it's not great, but he's probably being too candid, honestly, right? So. <laughs> You know, I think the thing that makes it awkward is that this week also Delta dumped its triple seven, some of which are not old at all, and basically said, when we do come back international long haul, we're going to be all Airbus. And by the way, we're the only one of the big four uh, in the U.S. that don't have a max position of any kind. And so, okay, the thing is we can remove Delta from the running. They're the healthiest of the four. So, all right, so Calhoun's comments, well, they don't affect Southwest uh, because Southwest is Southwest. They'll be all right. That leaves us with American United. So basically, he was saying one of their two big customers uh, in North America, in the U.S., they're going into business. That sort of targeted um, the impolitic nature of the comment, I guess. And if you were betting, is the guy who's in trouble American or United? Oh, boy. It's uh, <laughs> neither look like they're in great shape you know and one of the big variables of course is any degree of continued government assistance but american looks structurally a little weaker but united's business fundamentals not as good particularly because of the international long haul reliance so uh you know I, asia it's, it's and asia expo say. and asia exposure in particular uh, absolutely right yeah i don't I don't, I don't have a horse in the in this particular race um uh, i actually i'm, I'm not as you know, panicked by Calhoun's comments because I think that I think he was being brutally realistic. Ultimately, airlines don't place orders because they happen to like the guy that they shake hands with. I mean, that that might swing things at the very, very margin, but they do it because it's a duopoly and they want to maintain the duopoly. And this is why, you know, some airlines were talking about, you know, some all Boeing airlines were talking about buying A320s, why British Airways then started uh, placing an order for 737 MAX is they just want to maintain a duopoly at worst and preferably something with a little bit more competition. Uh, I, I don't see Calhoun's comments, brutal as they were, changing that. Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw this, but it, um, this morning um, out of the Middle East, uh, Emirates Group is saying that they're going to cut uh, 30,000 jobs and they're looking at the early retirement of their A380 fleet. That's a big deal. That's that's a very big deal. Um, A three eighty production was supposed to go through twenty one, right? Born to die. No, no, no. But I mean, does the it die? Production's at an end. The plane, the planes no, will be born the to die. Production's at an end. They've got the product. I'm, they're I'm just sorry. finishing a couple for uh, all, all Nippon Airlines now. Co no. Correct. I, I was just saying whether or not uh, you you wrap it up maybe a, a little bit a little bit faster. You mean, no, you can't. These, these things. things. These, yeah, things exactly. take, these things take, take two years to build. That, that's not the issue. The issue is that this tells us that uh, just as this you know, pandemic is clearly killing the 747-400 in passenger service, it's having the same effect on an even younger aircraft, the A380. And what is it going to mean for the 777 if somebody like Delta is getting out of it? 
Well, Delta Delta's move is is an interesting one in that they had, if, if I remember my number right, 18 triple sevens. It was a mixed fleet. Um, I think it was about two thirds GE 90s, one third Trent 1000s, right? So I think that's the 777 engine, the thousand. Um, so it was a mix between Rolls engines and, and GE engines. Um, and they were in the process of rebuilding their long haul fleet on the Airbus product anyway, right? So it, you know, it, obviously it's not great for Boeing, but it's not like they were going to buy more. So it's just taking a fleet type out that, um, that you know, is kind of inconsistent with what they were doing. Probably the bigger deal is to the engine guys, right? Because those are overhauls that won't happen. And those are nice overhauls and, and so on and so forth. So you know, when I look at what, what Delta is doing and even you know, what Emirates is doing with potentially going to do with the A380s, that's a lot of engines that are not going to get overhauled. And those engines aren't that old. In some cases, those engines aren't that old. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a lovely stat on the cost, the maximum cost of overhaul for a uh, for a big engine for a triple seven. Um, I was at MTU back in uh, the end of November last year uh, at their maintenance uh, headquarters in Hanover, and they said the biggest overhaul, the most expensive overhaul they ever did, and it was an insurance job, um, was for a GE ninety, which I think was uh, something like seventeen million dollars. Now there was a lot wrong with that engine, clearly, but uh, you know, missing out on any overhaul of a you know hundred thousand pound thrust uh, turbofan like that is a huge blow to a, to an engine company. Uh, Richard, uh, what does this kind of an announcement from an airline like Emirates, which was uh, seen as such a global powerhouse, mean more broadly for all of these Gulf carriers that have grown dramatically and have been seeing traffic decline for a little bit now, which has, you know, and, and then on top of everything, we, we saw COVID happen. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, well, funny you should ask, because the moment this crisis got real to me, as in, gee, no way out, this is going to be a seriously brutal couple of years, was also this week when uh, uh, Cotter, which well, I think we all agree is the ultimate, always expanding, no matter what, always going to grow, they announced they were going to get rid of some planes and shrink. Uh, that was an extraordinary moment. Um, so, <laughs> I, in other words, yeah, the super connectors in the Gulf are clearly not immune and indeed will be tracking everybody else on the way to cutting capacity and getting rid of jets that were, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps shouldn't have been built to start with. Um, but that just, the events this week, whether it was uh, Emirates and the 380 or, or Qatar and their uh, their downshifting plans, it just sort of brought it all home to me that there's going to be no pressure relief valve here. It's just going to be a brutal couple of years. Um, Sash, let me get, uh, just uh, to keep the conversation moving, talk to us a little bit about Airbus uh, cost cutting. You <coughs> wrote about that. Tell us what they're doing and is it enough? Um, yeah, I mean, Airbus had meetings with the unions in France and, uh, and Germany this week talking about uh, some major cost cutting uh, for the organization. Um, Airbus is clearly in a, you know, in a, uh, the difficult position as any very, very large European employer is in that they have to get restructuring agreed by the unions in the relevant countries before they actually announce anything. Um, uh, but they are looking clearly at restructuring uh, and at job cuts, which are well into double digits, because that's what they've got to do. I mean, they've already cut production of the civil aircraft by 37%, um, not, uh, you know, a third as they, uh, as they announced. And um, uh, we think that that's nowhere near enough. We think they've probably got to cut production by another third. Uh, so that suggests that, if they are to have a chance of getting back it or you know getting into profit and staying there, the cuts are going to have to be you know of the order of forty percent of uh, of um, you know direct touch employees, and that's something that I think is going to be very very hard to do, particularly in France and Germany. Uh, so, um, I mean, we don't think that Airbus can cut their way out of this crisis. Airbus is um, going to have to reduce production. Production is just too high. There is overcapacity in the airline market. Um, but the cuts are going to have to come as a result of those uh, of that uh, reduced production. And I think what we're going to see is this sort of um, almost tit-for-tat process of cut production, 
uh, and then negotiate for um, labor cuts and then cut production and then more labor cuts. Uh, and there's probably a couple of rounds of this to come yet. Um, Ron, I know you're paying attention not just to what Airbus is doing, but also for Boeing uh, in terms of their cost cutting. Are they anywhere near cutting the kind of cost that they need to cut? They have announced some layoffs, but not as dramatically as maybe are necessary. What, what, what should we expect to see from Boeing? Yeah, so, it, it, so far they've announced about what the 10% 10, 10 workforce reduction, I believe at this point, all voluntary. Um, and, and that would be coming out of uh, Boeing commercial. So if you look at you know, Boeing commercials, maybe 60% of the company. So that's something like a 15 to 17% uh, uh, workforce reduction. If all those bodies are coming out of Boeing commercial, uh, which I would imagine they try to make that happen. I don't know if, if it's voluntary, if they can make it that way, but that's probably what they try to do. Um, given the, the resizing that's going to have to take place because of the current state of the industry, it's probably not enough. Um, you, know, I, you know, I hate to you know, forecast uh, the probability of uh, non-voluntary layoffs, but uh, it, it's hard for me to imagine that that's not coming unless we were to see something dramatically change pretty quickly. Richard? Yeah, you know, um, I look at Boeing and, I, and I'm wondering how do they ramp up production from the seven, from zero to 20 and then 31 per month on the 737 MAX while cutting people. I, I, either they had a bunch of folks who were, who were idle this whole time um, and now suddenly some of them will be fired and some of them will be uh, put to work or they actually have to hire people. I mean, I just can't quite do the math, and I'm sure Ron has thought about this and, and maybe can uh, can enlighten me because, you know, they've been at zero for some time now on the max, and the challenge, the very uh, labor-intensive challenge of getting the 450 planes uh, converted to the necessary standard, plus resuming production for at 20 a month, even if they stay there, plus, of course, the challenge of getting teams out to help the 387 that were, uh, you know, already delivered back in service. That looks really labor intensive. So I don't see how that's consistent with a whole lot of additional big cuts unless they had a lot of idle people standing around. Just kind of backing up and looking, I mean, it, it just simply, if you look at the, the cost structure of the business, where the industry is going, they're going to have to take out cost. Um, and, and really the only place they can do it um, is in labor. So, you know, maybe it, it happens later, maybe they don't do it, but um, given where they are today, it, it just seems inconsistent with regard to the volume that they're going to have to do and the workforce that they have. Um, you know, with, and don't forget, I mean, 777 volumes, excuse me, not 777, 787 volumes are going down too. So there'll be spare bodies on that program. So, you know, between the 737 program, 787 volumes going down, 777 staying pretty flat. Um, I would imagine there's got to be you know, scarce, scarce, spare capacity in terms of labor floating around. That would be my guess. I could be wrong, but that would be my guess. Sash, talk to us uh, a little bit about Avianca. Uh, they filed for bankruptcy protection. How does that affect the ecosystem? You know, we've just talked about some other airlines uh, and the impacts and, and the problems they're going to face. Does Avianca presage more such announcements? And if so, where should we see them? Well, I think the, uh, the significance of the Avianca uh, Chapter 11 in the first instance is they're a big customer for Airbus. You know, they are an A320 Neo customer, got about 90 aircraft on order. And that's, uh, um, uh, you know, they're clearly not going to be taking those aircraft anytime soon. It really was one of the sort of the most impressively uh, delivered roll-up uh, you know, M&A businesses in uh, Latin American airlines and uh, had a very, very, had, has a very, very modern fleet. And so the degree to which that just does not seem to, uh, to work in the current circumstances is, um, is very worrying in terms of the degree to which other cross-border airlines also might not be able to uh, resist the downturn in demand from uh, COVID-19. And let's talk a little bit about India's uh, MMRCA uh, program. This has been an exceptionally long-running uh, effort where India has been looking for a new fighter. Uh, the Dassault Rafale uh, won that, but the contract was then truncated. So it's only going to be, I think, for 36 nuclear strike aircraft uh, that the uh, Indians are looking for. And then the competition was restarted. The chief of the Indian Air Force suggested that he wants the 
Tejas, uh, the light combat aircraft by Hindustan Aeronautics. Richard, where, where are we on this contract? Because Indian Air Chiefs regularly talk about what they want, and that's not what they get out of the National Security Council or, or, or the country's leadership. Yeah, you know, boy, it's just a bizarre moment. You know, I think there's a faction in India that it wants to say, well, we need eight or 900 uh, fast combat jets uh, for national security reasons. And another faction that says, uh, we need eight or 900 fast combat jets to convert fuel and money into uh, noise and jobs and uh, not much more. And uh, that looks like the latter one has prevailed. Uh, it's hard to tell what they mean it about the LCA. The LCA has been around for 25 years and they seem to be incapable of building and delivering it to a consistent standard or any level of combat effectiveness to reference yeah, another like, we've Like 33 of them have been developed or 30, 36 or something like that? Yeah, and an astonishing number are prototype or limited series production or just test aircraft. Very few are actually capable of getting up in the air and shooting at the enemy. And I'm not even so sure any air. And, you know, to reference another aircraft we discussed in this conversation, if I had to go to war in an LCA or an ARJ-21 regional jet, yeah, I'm going to the ARJ-21, probably more effective. <laughs> uh, so I'm thinking that they're... Ouch. It, it, it could be that they're merely thinking about continuing production. They built about 270 Sukhoi 30s under license, also by Hindu standard aeronautics. Could be they'll just keep going with that. But either way, you know, whether they got more Rafales or went with F 16s or F 18s or, or Typhoons, it would have been a revolution in Indian air power. And instead, they're retreating back to the era of the license Raj when it was all about jobs. And uh, it's kind of a sad moment. Wow. Uh... Uh, brutal, um, I, but India doesn't doesn't have an internet firewall, uh, Richard. For for what it's worth, so they can actually hear you there. Uh, Sash, anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I just I can't believe uh, this, and I think that uh, the head of the air force will be overruled on this one. Uh, the whole point about air power is that you are able to switch uh, it, and hence your. Um, uh, you, you know, your focus of power from one front to another using the same aircraft each time. So it's all very well to say that the light combat aircraft, the Tejas, would be sufficient against Pakistan, but the Indian Air Force has got to be able to take on the Chinese uh, at absolute full tilt. And a light combat aircraft up against even a J-10, which I personally think is actually a pretty good fourth generation or 3.75 generation aircraft, let alone any of the derivatives of the Sukhoi uh, 27 that the Chinese have got, let alone the J20, um, that's a joke. It really is. So uh, I, I'm not entirely certain what the, uh, the politics of this is. I think what it suggests is that the uh, contractual terms for the MMRCA contract were just too uh, tough, and hence that there were not any acceptable offers from the Lockheed Martin uh, with the, the wonderfully named F21. Remember, I mean, it's the sort of spinal tap of aircraft right. rebranding they turned it all the way up from 16 to 21 but it's the yes. same damn aircraft uh all the gripen all the uh rafale clearly all of them were um much too uh rigorous in terms of their pricing but going for the um lca the tejas that is not the answer and it's not an act of war in my uh, humble opinion and, and and you just have to admire an airplane that is called the vigorous dragon uh so it's 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 uh for, for the J-10. And finally, Ron, uh, just want to get your take. Seattle Times uh, has won the Pulitzer Prize, an extraordinary team there. Dominic Gates is one of them. Steve, uh, Mike Baker, as well as uh, Lewis Cam uh, for their coverage of the 737 MAX. We've talked about the MAX and Boeing almost every program uh, since uh, the first crash, uh, unfortunately. And um, oftentimes I've been talking about the tremendous reporting that this team did. Uh, certainly well earned. What are your thoughts now that they've won the most prestigious prize in journalism yeah they i mean they really were on the, the cutting edge of this right from uh, from the beginning uh, a, a lot of the news flow that that broke on the story particularly around the mcas system um came from the seattle times right so you know you know kudos to them you know, i think when this when this first happened before any of us that knew knew what mcas was um, a lot of us learned what you know the, the acronym MCAS was was from the Seattle Times. Uh, they were they were thorough, um, consistent, had a, you know this consistent cadence of reporting. So uh, you know, you know um, congratulations to them for doing you know, the, the the deep the deep digging that they did. 
uh, on the story as it developed and continues to develop, right? The airplane's still not sort of thing. Guys, thanks very much for that. Really, really appreciate it. And look for some more uh, in-depth uh, conversation next week. Hope everybody has a great week and see you next Sunday. Great to be here, Vargo. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Vargo. Thanks a lot, Vargo. Great to be here as always. And thanks for joining us. Please follow our daily interviews with top government, military, industry, and thought leaders at Defense and Aerospace Report and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Follow us on Twitter at Def Aero Report. That's at D-E-F-A-E-R-O Report. Like us on Facebook at Defense and Aerospace Report and check us out on LinkedIn. And check out our weekly cyber report sponsored by Northrop Grumman. For more than 80 years, Bell has pushed past the boundaries of what's possible to drive aviation forward, going above and beyond flight, bellflight.com. Thanks again to Bell for their generous sponsorship, and we'll see you again tomorrow.